Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And uh, staying with Brexit, Brussels has again firmly rejected Boris Johnson's insistence that the controversial backstop should be scrapped. We'll be talking to our political correspondent in a moment, but first, what is the backstop? Right now, UK and the Republic of Ireland are both in the EU, so there are no border checks between the two. But that changes after Brexit. Northern Ireland will leave with the rest of the UK, while the Republic will still be in the EU. Normally, that would mean border checks, precisely what both sides don't want. That's where the backstop comes in. If a future trade deal can't be agreed, the EU says there must be an insurance policy keeping the border open and Northern Ireland closely aligned with the EU. That's a no-no for the government. Well, our political correspondent, Ben Wright, is in Westminster for us. So, Ben, the two sides seem, well, as far apart as ever. Uh, they are, George, that's right. I think for the first two or three weeks of Boris Johnson's premiership, there was an eerie sort of standoff between the EU and the UK. Uh, the government here said there was no point talking to Brussels unless the backstop was ditched, and that was that. But now we have seen this eruption of letters, tweets, claims and counterclaims that show how far apart the two sides are, and I think how much rancor is running between them as well. So in the letter to EU leaders last night, Boris Johnson again said that the backstop had to go, said it was intolerable for the UK, but said he was open to looking constructively at other ideas. That got a really frosty knockback from the EU, who said he was offering nothing new, no real alternatives, and in fact was misleading on what the backstop actually amounted to. Downing Street then said there would be no deal, no prospect of a deal, unless the withdrawal agreement was reopened. Now, it's hard at this stage to know whether or not Downing Street really does think that there is the possibility of a new deal being reached or whether we are in the early stages of the no-deal Brexit blame game. We might have a better idea tomorrow when uh, Boris Johnson goes off to meet Angela Merkel in Berlin before going to see the French president in Paris. But certainly there is now very little time for some sort of new compromise to be found. Ben, thank you very much. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson to tonight told ITV News that he does have a plan for replacing the Irish backstop. Mr Johnson insisted that realistic alternatives to the backstop are available, but that the previous administration of Theresa May hadn't made a strong enough case for them. Mr Johnson said the EU's determination not to budge was the biggest obstacle to any new withdrawal agreement. He was speaking to our political correspondent, Paul Brand. He's told EU leaders it's anti-democratic, unviable, inconsistent with the sovereignty of the UK. But while the Prime Minister's clear what he makes of the Northern Irish backstop, what he hasn't described in detail is his alternative. In an interview today with ITV News, Boris Johnson said there are better ideas than keeping us in the customs union to avoid a hard border. They just haven't been argued for. Can you give me one solution? to the Northern Irish border that you'll be suggesting to the EU leaders that hasn't been suggested before? Well, I don't think actually that many of the solutions that are available have been uh, properly suggested before. They certainly haven't really been properly offered by the UK side. And of course, there are all sorts of uh, trusted trader schemes, uh, electronic free clearing and all the rest of it. These have all been suggested before. They have but been they, suggested before. They, They've been explored of, with the EU the, before. None of them have been properly suggested by the UK. Are you saying then that perhaps Theresa May didn't make the case convincingly enough? Yes, absolutely. Enough? Well, what I'm saying is that if you look at what the UK government was doing, it was basically reconciled uh, psychologically, emotionally, intellectually to remaining within the customs union and within the orbit of EU law. The Prime Minister will make his argument in Berlin tomorrow, meeting the German Chancellor, before visiting President Macron in Paris on Thursday and trying to twist a few arms at the G7 summit on the weekend. But today the President of the EU Council was unimpressed with the letter he received, saying the backstop is an insurance to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland unless and until an alternative is found. Those against the backstop and not proposing realistic alternatives in fact support re-establishing a border, even if they do not admit it. If a deal can't be found, ministers are still busy planning to leave without one. Have you come up with a solution to the backstop? Uh, no, not personally, no. Um... 
Unless someone does, Labour continue to warn of the dangers of no deal, with Jeremy Corbyn meeting businesses today to hear their concerns. It's very unclear what the Prime Minister thinks he's negotiating. He needs to recognise that by just holding uh, the threat of a no-deal Brexit on the 31st of October towards the European Union isn't going to bring about a change. And while MPs might still be on holiday, the Brexit debate never rests. The government facing protest about its strategy, not just at home, but abroad. Paul Brand, ITV News, Westminster. It was billed simply as an insurance policy against a hard border returning in Ireland if talks between the EU and the UK stalled. But the backstop has in fact become itself the main stumbling block to Brexit negotiations. Today the Prime Minister said there is no prospect of a deal with the EU if the backstop remains. Again, the EU reacted furiously, saying there was no other alternative. Simon Israel has more. Is there really an alternative to the backstop? The Irish border issue that's blocked any parliamentary agreement on a Brexit deal. Boris Johnson, in his letter to the EU Council President, appears to believe there is, although offers little detail. The Prime Minister says the backstop is anti-democratic and inconsistent with the sovereignty of the UK as a state, but adds the government would not put in place infrastructure checks or controls at the border. We would be happy, he says, to accept a legally binding commitment to this effect and hope that the EU would do likewise. I think the letter makes clear is that this really is now our best and last chance to get a deal, to get an agreement that can get through the House of Commons. And if we are unable, if the EU are unable to move on this issue, then we are going to leave on the 31st of October. That's what we've committed to. That was this morning. By lunchtime, Donald Tusk had tweeted the Council's response to Mr Johnson's basis for negotiations in the run-up to October the 31st. Mr Tusk was rather dismissive. He said those against the backstop and not proposing realistic alternatives, in fact support re-establishing a border, even if they do not admit it. Opening gambits or merely theatre? The Prime Minister responded to the response to his initial proposals. At the moment, it is absolutely true that our friends and partners are a bit negative. And you were getting, you know, I, I saw what uh, Donald Tusk had to say, and, and it, you know, it wasn't redolent of, of, of you know, a, sense of, uh, of optimism, but I, I think actually we'll get there. Uh, it's very unclear what the Prime Minister thinks he's negotiating. He needs to recognise that by just holding uh, the threat of a no-deal Brexit on the 31st of October towards the European Union isn't going to bring about a change, it's going to make things much worse. The government this afternoon issued a statement announcing that ministers and civil servants will no longer be attending most EU meetings from September the 1st. Representation no longer needed, it said. The priority was to unshackle officials so that they can refocus on Brexit plans and on trade agreements with other countries. Some Brexit opposing MPs said the Prime Minister is making demands he knows the EU will turn down so he can blame them if we leave without a deal. Equally, Mr Johnson is blaming some MPs who are trying to block a no deal for why the EU won't give concessions. He's meeting Angela Merkel in Berlin tomorrow to ask for just that. But with both her and Tusk insisting the withdrawal agreement cannot be reopened, there appears little prospect of a sudden change in direction. Simon Israel reporting. Well, I'm joined now from Dublin by Senator Neil Richmond, who is chair of the Irish Senate's Brexit Committee. So can anybody, Senator, on your committee see any way forward which respects the need for the European Union to have a seal on its, on its uh, trading community and yet at the same time not to have a border with Northern Ireland? Well, this has been the great difficulty that has been discussed over the last three years. And indeed, we flagged this long in advance of the referendum in the UK. It was extremely unfortunate that this situation and the UK's responsibilities to the border in Ireland and indeed the Good Friday Agreement were never discussed in the campaign, indeed weren't a factor. 
We have worked consistently on the European side with our British counterparts over the last 18 months through 18 tortuous months of negotiations to produce what is a compromise agreement, a withdrawal agreement that takes into account the British government's own red lines, their commitments, and indeed produces a withdrawal agreement with the backstop and a future partnership declaration that we believe is absolutely the pathway towards a managed Brexit. The difficulty is that in our own parliament, that went down. It didn't get through. Indeed, I see that. And it's quite interesting that a lot of focus has been on the backstop. But the 60 era GMPs wrote just last week saying that they'd reject the withdrawal agreement regardless. We see the Labour Party, the SNP, the Liberal Democrats, they didn't reject the withdrawal agreement because of the backstop. And indeed, the Prime Minister, who now is using extremely unfortunate language such as anti-democratic, backed this agreement himself. Is a border inevitable? We certainly don't think so. We very much hope so. But every day that we get closer to a no deal, both the Irish and British governments lose full control over that border. And that's what's crucially important here. We both have responsibilities as the co-guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement, an international peace treaty lodged with the United Nations. If we give up control, the British government will have responsibilities to the WTO, any future partners. But equally, the Irish government will seek to protect the single market which we are remaining within. We can work this out. As you said, there's about 10 weeks to go. But ultimately, we want to move on to the next stage of negotiations, armed with the insurance policy of the backstop that we never actually want to see come into play. One well, almost senses that the people, um, <clears throat> both, both north and south possibly, are kind of forgetting the utter carnage and horror that occurred around the border over all those years. Is that not informing any kind of part of the debate? Oh, we have not forgotten. I grew up during the Troubles, John. Just last night, we saw a very worrying development when a bomb exploded in Fermanagh right along the Irish border. Thankfully, no one hurt. Only a couple of months ago, we saw the sad murder of journalist Lyra McKee by dissident paramilitaries. There's been nine dissident paramilitary activities this year compared to just one last year. We know that. We bear it in mind. And that's why we need the backstop to ensure there is no hardening of order, that there isn't a risk to what is a very fragile peace process. We know that, we respect that, the European side has been consistent on it. However, it is the British government who equally has that responsibility and can't simply walk away from it and say they won't put up something when they will have responsibilities that might not make that possible. And do you think that that is uppermost in the minds of the people that are involved, both sides on this, both in Europe and both in Britain, uh, do you believe that, that, that those issues that you marked out so coherently are uppermost in their minds? Well, I can only speak for the European side, but I've met Michelle Barney, I've met President Juncker, President Tusk and incoming Presidents von der Leyen and Michelle, and they absolutely reaffirm their commitment to the Good Friday Agreement, as we've noticed a number of American congressmen and women have done too. But one thing that is clear is that Boris Johnson, as Foreign Secretary, never actually visited the border. Michel Barnier is upcoming for his sixth visit next month. Senator Richmond, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, sir. Tonight, the Prime Minister is getting ready to parley with the EU's two biggest leaders. The backstop he says is dead, the very backstop he once voted for. Following his letter to Donald Tusk, he prosecuted a new argument. That the backstop risks weakening the delicate balance embodied in the Good Friday Agreement, something Tusk batted away, but the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, on a visit to Iceland, appeared to take a more conciliatory approach, suggesting thinking about practical solutions and opining that the EU is ready to find a solution. Here is James Clayton. We already know what a Boris Johnson grand tour looks like. This was him as Foreign Secretary. But with just two months to go until the 31st of October, as Prime Minister, the tone of this latest tour will be perhaps more serious. Last night, Boris Johnson outlined what he wanted from the EU. In a letter to Council President Donald Tusk, he proposed getting rid of the backstop in its entirety, proposing instead alternative arrangements. Today, Donald Tusk struck back in a tweet. Those against the backstop and not proposing realistic alternatives, in fact, support re-establishing a border, even if they do not admit it, he said. Today, the Prime Minister hit back, saying any hard border on the island of Ireland 
would not be the fault of the UK. Under no circumstances will uh, the UK be putting in any kind of checks at the border in Northern Ireland. We simply don't think that that is necessary. So is this hard-nosed negotiation or have the recriminations already begun? Well, I think there's an element of preemptive blame game, uh, that's true. Um, but I also think that, that Boris has been pretty clear. Um, the Prime Minister wants a significant change to the backstop and really nothing else will do. I think there could be a point at which there's a lot of pressure on Ireland to reconsider and possibly um, look for compromise. Um, but I think the domestic pressure on um, the Irish Taoiseach and also the pressure he will have from EU capitals because he has made a big thing of this backstop. It's very difficult for him at the last minute to say, actually, um, after all, I didn't act re really need a backstop in this form and I can live with something else. Theresa May's pitch to the EU was always that she'd walk away. No deal was better than a bad deal, a phrase that the EU never fully believed. There was always the prospect of Parliament tying the hands of the Prime Minister and stopping a no deal, which of course they did. But this time, things are different. It's hard to imagine the EU changing their position until it's worked out who holds the balance of power in Parliament. It's difficult to negotiate with someone when you don't know how strong their hand is. But if this summer of speculation has taught us anything, it's that MPs are going to struggle to stop a no deal, particularly as opponents to it are far from united. The German government and surely also other European governments are now looking once more to London and they want to see what happens in the House of Commons. They read the news, they see that there's a lot of um, resistance growing in the House of Commons by Tory MPs, but also obviously by MPs of the opposition. And they want to see what is going to happen, likely to be on the 9th of September. And the result of that will then determine what is uh, the next action that the European Union might take or not. September the 9th is the date many think the No Deal rebels will strike. By amending a government motion, it's possible they could take control of the order paper. But ultimately, it's Ireland that Boris Johnson has to convince to ditch the backstop. And at the moment, they're putting up a united front. Well, you, you are hearing more critical voices uh, in the Irish commentariat about uh, the, the government's posturing and, and positioning on the backstop. Uh, and uh, that, that is uh, something that's being heard more often. But uh, politically, there has been universal support for the backstop by all of the opposition parties. Although Boris Johnson will be meeting the German and French leaders, many believe they'll be taking their cues from Ireland. The EU, the other 26 member states, very much listen to what Ireland wants. And if Ireland at the end of the day would, st would say, look, uh, we trust the British, um, even though there's no backstop, we can be, we are reassured that the border will stay open. Of course, there is a possibility, but I think this is really a very hypothetical discussion. The governments and the EU's red lines are incompatible. So expect a lot more of the Boris Johnson charm offensive in the weeks to come. James Clayton well to discuss today's back and forth between Boris Johnson and Donald Tusk. I'm joined in the studio by Andrew Bridgen, MP, member of the Conservative Party's Eurosceptic European Research Group. But first live from Brussels, Elmar Brock, former German, German MEP and member of the European Parliament's Brexit Steering Group. Good evening to both of you. Elmer Brock, uh, Boris Johnson is telling Angela Merkel that getting a deal, getting a Brexit deal, is his highest priority. Do you take him at his word? No. I know Boris Johnson since many years personally. I think he needs an alibi that he can go to a hard Brexit. I do not believe that. Uh, and you have to know we have to protect the consumer's health, the integrity of the internal market, and if Britain will leave the Euro European Union, we must find a solution for that, especially at the Irish border. But Both no. Irish parts, I, the Northern uh, Ireland uh, people and the Republic of Ireland people are in, do not want to leave the European Union or they want to have a solution by an agreement. And therefore this agreement we need because the, the Irish-Irish border is a uh, European front line it has to be find a solution in order to protect the integrity of the internal market and therefore that we need a solution. Let's use 
nobody of us wants to have this customs union at the end of the day at the way as it is in the, uh, in, in the but, backstop. But we've got in his letter to Donald Tusk... But an insurance. Yeah, but in his letter to Donald Tusk, uh, you know, Boris Johnson comes up with another argument. He said that the backstop now uh, would, in fact, um, be problematic for the delicate balance of the Good Friday Agreement. Is that a legitimate concern? No, the good the people who are responsible for the Good Friday Agreement, I talked to all of them on both sides of that line, are in favour of a practical solution like we have it now. And if we have used the transitional period in a proper possible in a in a, in a good way, uh, in order to have a free trade agreement or whatsoever. Uh, then uh, I think we do not need a backstop. It's just an insurance to 99.9%. The backstop will never work if we use the transitional period in the proper time, but it is an insurance that we need it. And that at the end of the time, I do not believe that a backstop uh, is needed at the end of the time. Yes. So and therefore, I do not need the British policy. argumentation. You say it's an insurance yeah. policy, but if Boris Johnson insists there'll never be a hard border, and the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar insists there'll never be a hard border, what other of the European 26 left are going to say you have to have that hard border? Is there not a, a, an opportunity now for good faith? I think the argumentation by Johnson and Varadkar are totally different. That's not the same statement. We can find a solution that there will be not a hard ball, and that is this agreement we have negotiated between the two governments. If Britain has another proposal to achieve that as an insurance, Boris Johnson should make such a proposal. But to make not a promise if we in the transition period do not agree that mm. we find a solution at the end of the day. We do not trust that it will work. And therefore, I think, come up with another proposal. Our original proposal was a weaker one. That but, was but controlled the in the EU... harbours of Dublin and Belfast. That was, a br the... uh, that was a Brussels proposal. The present yes. proposal of the Customs Union was a British proposal, not yeah. a proposal of the European Union. But be honest, would the EU actually put up a hard border? We do not want to have a hard border. But would you put but it we up? But we want to protect the integrity of the internal market. Let's see. You make this wonderful agreement with the United States. Then we'll become products in from the United States. We do not want to have on because of the, our consumers' health, for example, because of the integrity of the internal market, not on our European market, who protects us against right. that. Right. So Elmer Brock didn't make such a policy. Sorry to interrupt, Elmer Brock. We don't have much time. I just want to ask you one final question. Do you have faith in uh, the MPs at Westminster blocking a no deal exit? There's a majority against the no deal. The House of Commons has showed that. And do hope that because of the case of democracy, the British government will not stop the House of Commons to make its position where the majority of House of Commons is. Not in order to create a hard Brexit, which is not good for us, but it would be a disaster for the United Kingdom. You will lose 10% of the GNP. We in Germany will lose 0.5% of our GNP. That is the difficulties for the United Kingdom. And therefore, let's find a proper solution, which we have found in an agreement. We can do a lot of things in the political declaration to right. clarify, to make it sure so, that we, at the end of right. the day, will not come to the backstop so that Thank you very all much, the Elmer arguments Brock. in the United Kingdom are not right. Even the question of sovereignty is not concerned. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, as I said, Andrew Bridgen, the Conservative backbencher, is here with me. Andrew Bridgen, first of all. Uh, Boris Johnson is telling Donald Tusk, get rid of the backstop, I can get this withdrawal agreement through Parliament. Is he right? He probably is, but it's far from an excellent uh, deal for the UK, even if you take out so would you vote against the backstop. It? I would have to take a very long and pragmatic uh, look at whatever Boris Johnson could bring back. But I have major concerns over the money, the so-called divorce bill, there's no mention of £39 billion in the withdrawal agreement. Yeah, but that's and the way I read spent. it, we could be liable for extra payments at the discretion of the European yeah. Union until but, 2028. But, 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 but the big picture, the big picture is, one assumes, maybe wrongly, that you want a deal. Yes. Uh, so, I really so, want a, a super Canada free trade yeah, deal. But, but you want a deal, and, and, and you know this is about country over party. So what is it that you would really...
put your back against the wall and say, I will not vote for this without the backstop. Even the backstop goes, I will not vote for this withdrawal agreement. What is so blindingly important? I think having uh, the end of the jurisdiction of the European courts in our country after we've transition, left... Transition? Transition? That'll go at the end of transition. What happens if... We get rid of the backstop, uh -huh. which Boris is absolutely right. That's in breach of the Good Friday Agreement because it changes the relationship between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK uh -huh. without the agreement of Northern Ireland. And that's clearly in breach of the Good Friday uh, Agreement. What else in the withdrawal agreement is so sacrosanct? <coughs> I mean, you, that you, you, you don't like it in such a way that it, it would certainly kill the agreement. There are many, many niggles with it. I mean, why are we offering... Um, to give exemptions from income tax for current and former employees from the European Union. But you, and, would, and, and, you would risk and, a deal for that. And um, immunity from prosecution. I also I want to extend every right and privilege of British citizenship to the EU mm -hmm. nationals who wish to remain in the UK. They're very, very welcome. But they shouldn't have more rights than UK citizens. That would, again, create two tiers of citizenship, and that's not right, not fair. So exactly what do you think Boris Johnson can get out of this meeting in Europe? I think he will get the backstop dropped, but not while Parliament are threatening votes of confidence. You've heard tonight from our European colleagues that they're, they're watching what's going on in our Parliament. And while there's that division and that threat, they're not going to enter into serious negotiations. I think the compression point will come probably four weeks before we're due to leave, and then we'll get into serious negotiations and we'll see how much they want to deal. And as for what will happen in terms of trying to stop a no-deal Brexit by some of your Conservative colleagues, what do you think the best bet they've got? I think the only bet they've seriously got, unless the uh, Speaker of the House of Commons pulls something out of the hat and breaks major precedents again, is uh, a vote of no confidence in the government. And that's a huge step for a Conservative MP to vote against his own government, potentially triggering a general election, a general election at which they will lose the whip and not but, be a candidate. But do you think uh, that um, Boris is acting with a kind of nod and a wink from Jacob Rees-Mogg? Do you think Jacob Rees-Mogg is saying, go ahead, see what you can get? Do you think there is a softening of the line of the ERG? <clears throat> I think that Boris has got to offer an olive branch to the EU and, and, and be seen to be willing to negotiate. But and, and some of that is for the domestic audience as well. Some of my colleagues who are less convinced of the merits of a managed no deal. But for me, the easiest and cleanest way out is to invoke GATT24, which gives us the ability to have up to 10 years of tariff and quota-free trade, as we've got now, while we negotiate that free trade agreement that we all want. Adam thank you very much indeed. Thank you.